Coming up next, we've got news from the world of greyhounds, and we're joined by one of Australia's finest racing greyhound trainers, Robbie Britton. Stay tuned. Greyhound Nation starts now. This is Greyhound Nation, episode 37, recorded June 1st, 2023. Robbie Britton, training the Australian racing greyhound. Greyhound Nation is a podcast for greyhound enthusiasts produced by greyhound enthusiasts. To learn more about our show and its hosts, visit our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Greyhound Nation podcast. I'm Michael Burns. And now, here's your host, John Parker. Thanks, Michael. We're excited to have his, uh, our episode guest this time, uh, Robbie Britton from Australia. He's one of uh, Australia's top Greyhound trainers, and we're really excited to have him on and have a conversation with him. We've got a little news to share first. Uh, there's a new book out by one of our frequent guests, Greyhound author and historian Charlie Blanning. He's made a foray from nonfiction writing into fiction writing, and he's got a new novel out with a greyhound as the title character. Uh, I've gotten an advanced copy of it, thanks to Charlie's kindness, and this is a this is a copy of it right here. Rags oh, wow. to Riches. That's, that's a good looking book. Now, where's my copy? <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do about that. How uh, how can uh, how can folks order a copy? It's, uh, it'll be available in uh, early July, but uh, you can pre-order it now by going to Charlie's uh, Facebook page, The Greyhound and the Hare. Uh, you'll see right up in the upper right-hand corner a blue Shop Now button. Just click on that, and that'll get you to the, uh, to the order process. Uh, Charlie sells out most of his books. He's printed 1,000 copies of this one, so you don't want to delay and, and miss out. So go ahead and get that order in uh, if you're <laughs> so inclined. Lesson learned. I did that with my with his first book. It took me forever to get a copy, and they are very hard to get after they go out of print. Uh, what other news from the Greyhound Nation, John? Well, we've got uh, the uh, as we record this, we have the qualifying heats of the uh, English Greyhound Derby going on at the Toaster Track there in England. Uh, so far, last year's winner uh, Romeo Magico is doing quite well. And he's all he's won his uh, qualifying heat so far, and he's looking to uh, to repeat his win of last year. Uh, then here on the American side, we've got a great American greyhound named Cet Dirty Dilly. Uh, she just recently won her 112th career win up in West Virginia at the uh, Tri-State Track, and she's doing she's going great. She just she just wins and wins every time uh, she runs. So uh, we'll look forward to following her uh, her career and maybe at some point we can uh, we can have one of her connections on uh, as a guest here well speaking of west virginia connections i have one uh in my personal greyhound family uh my eldest greyhound winston formerly known as wk sampson uh he just turned 13 that's a new milestone in our ha- household and uh, uh he was bred out of white kennels in in um West Virginia, and he raced in Birmingham. So we're very proud of him. He's still still trucking along, showing his age, but uh, he's he's got some. I think I think what's keeping him going is he's got a little bit of a Hall of Famer, uh, Lonesome Cry uh, from the American Greyhound Hall of Fame. So, a little shout out to him tonight. Yeah, that's great. If you can get a Greyhound to 13 years of age, you're doing pretty well. I I hope so. Uh, we're we're glad to have him. So let's, uh, that's the news for this evening. Let's, uh, let's bring on our guest, uh, Robbie Britton. Well, we're real pleased to have uh, as our guest on this episode from Down Under, Robbie Britton. Robbie, good day and, uh, and welcome. Yeah, hello, John. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. It's uh, good to talk to the other side of the world. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's start a little bit. Uh, you're, you're pretty well known as uh, one of Australia's uh, top Greyhound trainers. Let's start at the beginning and tell us a little bit about how you got into greyhounds. Are you a first generation or second or third generation greyhound guy? I'm second generation. My my dad, uh, uh, I think back in about '63, uh, got his first greyhound. Uh, he was a hobby trainer at the time, and uh, 
we in Australia here we have hobby and professional, and uh, he he. We were addicted to it. We grew up, all, all the Britain kids grew up uh, handling greyhounds. And uh, I think it, I always had a greyhound as a hobby, uh, hobby trainer up until I was 40 and I decided to, that was it. I chucked in work and uh, decided to go professional. Oh, well, that's great. I'll ask you a little bit about that, uh, the, the difference between the hobby and the professional trainer. Is that still the case? Can you still be a hobby trainer in uh, Australia? Yeah, absolutely. You can train one dog out, out of your backyard uh, or you can be a professional trainer and have uh, 200 dogs in, in, a, uh, in a kennel setup. But um, it's, it's a good system because anyone can be involved, although the, uh, uh, you've got to, you know, the code of practice and the integrity of it side of it is uh, you can't just decide to be a greyhound trainer. You've got to apply and jump through all the hoops as well. Yeah, yeah. What was your, uh, as, as a kid growing up there, what was your first Greyhound job on the farm? Uh, well, it was everything really to, you know, the feeding, to the uh, picking up the poop, to um, walking the dogs. We did a lot of walking in those days. Um, and as I said, that was in, in, in the enjoyable part, walking a dog and dreaming of what might happen. <laughs> Now, were you at some age? Were you designated a, a, a greyhound by your dad? Or did he say, uh, "Robbie, this so and so is is your greyhound"? Yeah, I had a uh, uh, had a female greyhound given to me. Uh, I think when I was about eighteen, I just can't think. That's a hell of a long way back. But uh, called the Vixen. The Vixen was my first dog, and she wanted a second start, so that had me hooked. Oh yeah, that's all it takes, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's uh, and as I said, it's uh, back in those hobby days, uh, it was very, very enjoyable because it was, uh, you know, you just couldn't wait to go to the races, and uh, it was just, just. Uh, I, I thought it was a lot better those days than than the, than the professional era. Yeah, yeah. Now, how back though in those days when you were eighteen, nineteen, twenty, how many, uh, how many greyhounds did the Britton family have at that time? Well. Uh, Dad only Dad had twelve dogs. At, uh, he was racing at the time, and that in those days was sort of considered a fairly big kennel. Uh, it, but the next era, say um, from the um, late seventies to to the nineties, it, it it came quite professional. And you know, my brother now that trains, he's got two hundred. And, and that's basically what happened. It, you know, next thing, someone's got 40, next thing, someone's got 60, and it just grows. But that's that's what's happened in, over the years. But I think Australia, that's one thing that I like about Australian racing. You've got a healthy mix that anyone can be involved at any level. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful way to have it, I think. Uh, what, um, uh, and where were you all based? What was the, where was the Britain farm back in those days? We, we lived in uh, Victoria, which I still do. That's uh, down the bottom of Australia. Uh, in those days, we were sort of four to five hours away from the main tracks. That was a place called Portland. Uh, then we shifted down to closer to Melbourne, where the main uh, racing is or the main uh, tracks. And uh, as I said, uh, grew up in Portland. And then with the dogs and the puppies and going out into the fields with them, it, it was that was the fun bit. And as I said, uh, then we moved to a place called Lara, which I'm still at. And that's an hour away from uh, Sandown and the Meadows, which are our two main tracks. And, and did you and your dad and your family, did you breed greyhounds as well as train and take them to the track? I think my, my yeah, we, in those days when it was hobby, you always bred your own litter, uh, raced your own litter. Um, and I think when dad, how he got involved, he was given a, a brood bitch and uh, she had 16 pups so that, that was his uh, uh, <laughs> that's his first go into greyhound racing so so that's how it all started 16 puppies was that uh, was that by live cover or artificial insemination no it was live cover oh, everything my. in those days, everything in those days was live cover <laughs> how did you manage with 16 puppies on on one mother well, it was interesting because I think that if I remember, we ended up, there was a uh, a friend that had a, a golden, not a golden retriever, an Alsatian or German shepherd that was had milk. 
and she helped out as well. So they we had uh, we had some of them. I think some of them on the German Shepherd and and some of them on the Greyhound. <laughs> You know, I think that may be the most I've ever heard of, of a Greyhound litter. I've heard of 14, maybe yeah. I've heard of 15, but I don't know that I've ever heard of 16. Was that the most your family's ever had? Yeah, absolutely. I can't recall anything anything more than that. And how did those puppies go on to be as racers? Uh, great. It was, um, you know, the first, first litter. And to be honest, uh, Dad's, you know, even though we didn't know everything about greyhound racing in those days, his first few litters were all very handy type race dogs. Um, I think that Dad, he was a good uh, teacher for us because he he was meticulous. He did everything uh, right from the whelping to the rearing, the feed, everything had to be perfect and he was totally dedicated to it. So it, it proved, gave us good uh, thought down the process that, uh, that you can't have any weak link in the chain. You've got to do everything right. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the physical setup. Uh, you had a kennel, and then uh, what, what was the what was the setting like? Uh, in those days, it was basically an old dairy that was moved um, made into kennels. But uh, and and again, you had uh, you know day yards and things like that. You let your dogs out into, um, and and for the puppies about uh, two acre paddocks that, uh, but most of our work with the puppies, we'd either go out to a hundred acre paddock and, and let them run free at, you know, four to six to seven months. Um, that was our fun at the weekend. And yeah. Uh, yeah, as I said, it was a, it was just a fun thing really. Um, these days, uh, my kennel at home is, uh, I've got about 32 in, indoor race dog kennels and probably about 40 puppies being reared out in, in yards and runs. Um, we, we, we're changing over a little bit. Over the last 20 or 30 years, I've really just trained for other people and uh, been the trainer and had, had uh, good owners. Uh, over the last two to three years, I've changed and been doing a fair bit of breeding myself, trying to scale down and just have my own dogs and get back to the fun side again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now your current setup, you know, we're familiar with the, um, anybody that's been to a, a Greyhound farm in, in, in Abilene, and I know you've been there. Uh, how, do, how does your setup compare to what we see there? Uh, do you have the long runs, for example, where the young puppies are kept with their litter mates? Yeah, uh, very much so. It's, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, rearing, some people rear in long runs. We have long runs. Uh, other people have large square paddocks. Uh, but the, the, the kennels, inside kennels in, in Australia there, uh, in the code of practice, they have to be, uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, three, three square metres? Yeah, three square metres. So they're, they're, they're a little bit bigger than the American um, kennel. Um, and I think myself, I think that's a good thing. It's uh, image wise, I I, I've been in Abilene, I've had a small farm in Abilene, but, and I've had the small, smaller um, pens and I know it makes no difference and the dogs like them but image wise I think our kennels look look better to the outside public yeah now in the in the inside kennels do you have the kind of the setup they have in um, say Ireland and, and England where the instead of the crates the the kennels are more like uh, for lack of a better term jail cells with a couple yeah. of dogs yeah. in there in each one no, uh, it, I've, I've been to Ireland too, and I know what you mean about the two dogs in each one. I, I do like the idea, actually. I think it's it's good for the greyhounds. But no, in Australia, we're basically one in each cell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, are they are they are they what they call the six pack? Uh, the the where, where there's ones on top of another, or are they are they all on the floor, so to speak? No, no they're all all on the floor. So yeah. as I say, it's a a little bit more room where they've got a. They've got their sleeping bed, and they can walk out into a couple of uh, couple of square yards at the at the front. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go back a little bit to your days of, as a, as a young hobby breeder. Paint a picture for us as to what your regular your root your weekly routine was when you were a hobby breeder, as far as going to the track, how many how many days or nights a week, and that sort of thing. Well, well, initially getting up in the morning, you'd probably get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock to work your dogs, uh, simply because you had to go to work. 
Uh, you might have to be at work at seven o'clock or whatever. And then uh, at the time, my wife was a teacher. She would come home at lunchtime to let them out, empty the dogs. I'd get home. We'd get home at night. Or if we were racing, uh, she may even bring the dogs down to Melbourne, and I'd hop in the car and we'd head off to from work to the races. So it it was a really it's a juggle, but it's probably no more of a juggle than any anyone else playing any other sport where they go to work and they've still got commitments to training and, and to ra- to whatever sport they play. Yeah, yeah. What was the drive time uh, to if you were driving to Melbourne for the races? How how far a drive did you have? It's uh it's just over an hour. Um, to to both city tracks, we we call them city tracks here, Melbourne tracks. They're uh, about an hour, and uh, these days with traffic, though, it can be two. Yeah, and then um, how how many nights or was it night racing, oh, day racing? What was the yeah, routine? Yeah, look, in those days, it was probably all night racing, um, and uh, Meadows and Sandown in those days only raced once a week. Now they race twice a week. Uh, and some tracks like Geelong, which is just down the down the road from us, now they they used to be once a week. Now they're three times a week. So I think um, we probably don't utilise our tracks as well as they do in America. Uh, as far as you know, you race more often there. But um, in saying that, uh, it worked well in the times. And and every I, I would say that our tracks were more like clubs. Um, it, they were they were clubs that were run by greyhound people in, in those days. Um, they had committees, and they they would basically race once a week, and that was their social out, outing as well. Yeah. So so no. So most dogs would not race more than once a week, if that. No. It's even now today. <coughs> it's very rare. You might double up a dog uh, once, but you don't do it over the next few weeks. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's. Uh, Basically, it's it's not hard to get a start. It's not as though you you have to uh, wait. But uh, in saying that, uh, well, I know in my case, I, once a week is is what I do. Yeah. And uh, typically, when you when you back in those days, when you were a hobby trainer, did you uh, did you typically take more than one dog on any given evening to the track, or were you usually just taking one down? Um, in those days, it might be two or three. Um, we we had what we called uh, uh, panel vans in those days. It was uh, they were um, like a car with um, two seats at the front and a little bit at the back, and you might take two or three. And, and but interestingly, uh, when I've been to Ireland, I see the same thing there now. I see that there's no big trailers or no big uh, big vans. It's it's nearly all a lot of that hobby. Where they take the family go along with their one to three dogs, yeah. But uh, that's changed over our way, though. It's uh, there's the big trailers are out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In those days, did this, was the club atmosphere? Did that include, you know, kind of a food and beverage component? Did people come to the track to have dinner and or have drinks and watch the dogs run, or what was it like back then? Yeah, it was very much a social outing. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say the uh, the food was, uh, um, you know, restaurant class, but it, it was. That's where that's where the family went for tea, or dinner. Um, bookmakers that that was very very exciting in those days where most of most of the tracks had uh, might have had twenty or thirty bookmakers, and the, the fun of the the night really was to me as a kid or eighteen to twenty year olds just watch being in that bookmaking ring watching the action seeing what the plungers are, seeing what's being backed and not being backed. And uh, that, that, those days were fun. But today, people go there, they have dinner. There's less atmosphere simply because it's most of the betting's done off course yeah. and uh, through tele- to TV and phones and, and internet. So that, that um, the characters of the game in the, in the punting side have sort of gone out of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's really, it's been good for the sport from the financial standpoint, but from the standpoint of the spectator experience, that's probably diminished it somewhat, hasn't it? Yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, 
Now, back in those days when you were a hobby trainer, could you were you allowed to uh, wager on your own dog if you wanted to? Yes, you could, um, and, and that was most, and it's still the case today. Uh, we're allowed to wager on our own dogs. We can't bet against ourselves, but we can, <laughs> <laughs> but we can uh, bet on our own dogs. And, and those days, uh, you know, like as a hobby trainer, I think most people had a bet, and uh, they liked their dog on a certain night or not, not other nights. But again, as the professionalism came into it, and like myself in particular, you tend to train purely for prize money and and the, you start to get, get a few brains, I guess, and decide why, why give it back when they're going to give it to you in prize money. <laughs> exactly. Now, um, as a hobby trainer, did you have to have the same licensing as, a, as the professional trainers? Yeah, it was basically the same, other than I do recall in those days, I think you had to have a, a hobby license uh, for maybe a, a number of years before you were allowed to get a professional license. So, in other words, you couldn't have bulk dogs or anything like that. I'm not yeah. certain how it works now, but I do know that uh, uh, it's it's quite rigorous to get a greyhound trainer's license. Even as an owner nowadays, they, you've got to have police checks. Um, the code of practice, they come around and inspect your kennels, um, and, it's, and you've got to have a what they call a business management plan. Um, which is quite detailed on on your routine, on your feeding, um, on your on on your facilities. Uh, so I, I think that's been a good change, even though at the time we thought it was a bit of a pain. Um, it's been a good change for the integrity of the sport and and cleaning up the the bottom end of the sport. Yeah, the people that don't want to be bothered with that sort of thing are probably folks you don't really want in racing anyway, aren't they? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So you just. Uh, you know, at the edges, there's always issues, but again, um, that's not just greyhound racing, that's in everything. But, oh, but yeah. if you can uh, yeah, get rid of the the people you don't want in the game, it makes for a better game. Now, um, what? tell us about what led you to become decide you wanted to leave the hobby training uh, part of it and, and enter the professional. What, what was going on with you at the time and your dogs that said, you know, I think I want to do this full time. I always wanted to do it, but uh, the catalyst was uh, my dad was offered a contract in uh, Macau for two two years. Uh, that was, I can't recall, back in the 80s, I think. So he was offered a, a, a contract by uh, Dr. Jim Gannon, who was a, a leading vet in Australia at the time and used to go over to Macau. So dad went over there first year as a, uh, a trainer and then the next couple of years as, as the chief steward. So. There was a lot of dogs, when I said my dad only had 12 dogs at the time, but there was a lot of dad's owners uh, looking for someone to take over those dogs. And that, I basically took over uh, a number of the dogs that uh, were left behind when dad left and, and had some of those owners then for a lifetime. Yeah. Now, when you transition over to being a professional trainer, are you more training other people's dogs or are you still training some of your own or is it a mix or, or how does that work? It, it can be a mix. Um, and as I said before, early days, all I did was train for other people. Um, and in Australia, it's, uh, I'm not certain how it works in America properly, but once the dog gets into your kennel and ready to race, it's everyone's most people do a 50-50 deal, so there's no money changes hand other than prize money. So, in other words, you're not uh, you're not um, charging people like they do in Ireland to to uh, keep the dog. It's uh, purely a 50-50 deal. So, I had nearly everyone else's every every kennel was full with someone else's dog. Uh, I've transitioned a bit of that, you know, as as I've got older, I've bred the odd litter. Um, I, I end up bringing some females back from America, so I had to do something with them, so I bred with them. So so that's how it's all started. But as I said, you transition. But it, again, uh, it's quite stressful to be a trainer purely for other people as well, because you know, you're know you always on the phone, a, a bad run. They're always wanting to know what happened, um, why the dog's weight was up a, a pound, all that sort of stuff. So, so I'm I'm sort of getting to the stage now. I'm just quite happy to have my own. 
Yeah, I can see. I can imagine that. Do you have a? Uh, you know, they have this tradition in uh, in England. I know where you have uh, uh, kennel kennel Sundays when any of the owners can come and visit their dogs. And I, is is Australia too too spread out to have that, or is that is that a tradition there as well? No, no. It, it 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 may be in some kennels, and I know my sister in Perth uh, does have th- a system like that, but. Most of mine, we, we have a lot of dogs in Victoria that come from interstate. Uh, so, for example, uh, for a good 25 years, Victoria was the place everyone wanted their dog to race. The prize money was outstanding. Uh, the better it was perceived that the better uh, facilities were in Victoria. So if there was a very, very good dog in New South Wales or Queensland or Western Australia, they tended to get to Victoria somehow. So a lot of our owners were interstate, so we saw very few of them. Yeah, and and do you typically uh, have individual owners or syndicates, or what's kind of the the lay of the land there? Uh, mo- most owners have been either uh, singular or uh, are partners, um, but we are now starting to see a little bit of syndication, probably not enough, I'd like to see more of it, but um, it's certainly, uh, certainly there's been a, a growing trend towards that. Yeah. Now, as you've come along in your training uh, experience, um, how many typically, has it all been in Victoria? Uh, well, um, yes and no. I I, I bought a, uh, I don't know, I might have been in the bar long, too long one night, but I ended up buying a uh, property in Abilene and I had, had for six or seven years, I had a, a property in Abilene and I sent my son over there to work there. We raised some puppies and raised some, and we sold some through the auction. Uh, but yes, most of it's been in uh, uh, Victoria, it, it, you know, and I've basically been at the same place for the last 35 years. Yeah. Have you expanded the facilities? Uh, not a great deal, no. It's It basically takes, as I said, those 35, about 35 race dogs. Uh, but in saying that, uh, just to explain, going back to the last question, uh, we do a lot of travelling as well. So, for example, even this month we've raced in Perth, which is in Western Australia, which is uh, five hours on an aeroplane um, to the west. I'm up here in Brisbane right now, which is two hours on an aeroplane to the north. Um, we've raced in Sydney, which is 12 hours in a car in a in a van. Uh, so. What happens is we tend, if you've got the, what we call group or stakes race type dogs, you tend to chase those races. So you might have your base in Victoria, but you may do quite a lot of traveling to, to chase those races. Yeah. Now, do the dogs travel with you or are they there? Are they in a kennel closer to the track? And you, you're the, the, the human travels, but the dogs live closer to the track. No, the dogs come with us and they go home with us. And that's, as I said, like if you go to uh, uh, to Sydney, which is a re- fairly regular thing, um, it'd be a 12-hour trip up and turn around and 12-hour 12, 12 trip home and do the same thing next week and often the week after. Oh, my so, goodness. And the, but this trip to Brisbane on, on at the moment, because it's too far, it's 24 hours in a, in a, in a van, uh, we drove the dogs up here, but uh, I'll set up a kennel here and I'll be here for the next three weeks. Yeah, and and where will you be racing from that kennel? What tracks will you be racing? At? That's that's Albion Park in Brisbane, and uh, right now they've got a they're in the middle of a uh, uh, a carnival here that the the Brisbane Cup will be the finale, and that's uh, I think six hundred thousand to the winner. It's of a million. Oh my! Um, we raced last night and uh, in what they call the Flying Amy, which is named after an outstanding female greyhound. Uh, that's 150,000 next week to the winner of that. Um, so all all this month there'll be feature races. Uh, uh, that's why the people with the elite dogs migrate to these these uh, carnivals. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's something else. Um, when you did the dogs ever fly with you? Yes, uh, actually, I had to trial some dogs or. Uh, up here, so we actually, I actually brought five up on the aeroplane with me. So I had uh, a worker 
bring um, 10 up in, in, the, in the van and I, I flew five up. Oh, wow. Now, and, and they, this is, these are regular passenger aircraft that they're on and they're flying in, in cargo, just like when we bring the Australian Greyhounds over for rehoming here in the US, except it's yeah, a they, shorter they, trip. Yeah, they fly in the belly of the plane and look, uh, it's, it's, it's quite safe, it's quite good. Um, it's, and our climate's such that you, uh, it's, it's not stinking hot or anything like that most times. So it's not, not as though you're uh, worried about dogs sitting on tarmacs or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and do you find that they need any time after a flight like that to kind of let down or are they ready to go the next day or what's, what's been your experience with that? I think it's the, uh, it comes down to the individual dog. Um, some dogs do, they'll stress out a touch and, and it'll be a, uh, uh, you might need to give them a week to recover. Um, other dogs, they get off the plane, they know, they, a lot of the older dogs, they know what they're doing. They, they actually, you know, they know that if they're going on in the, in the crate and onto the airplane, they know, they know they're going racing. And uh, I, I, I'm absolutely convinced there's a number of them absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. They know when they get on the plane that uh, they're, they're headed to go, go race yeah. somewhere. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now, um, how does the purse structure work uh, in in racing in Victoria? Now, is it a is it um, is purse money paid paid to so many placements down the line, or how does that how does that work? Yeah, it's correct. It's uh, uh, first to fourth get paid. Uh, it's around about sixty uh, percent of the pool or the prize money pools to first. Uh, just can't recall the rest how it works but uh, and then they pay uh, from everyone gets traveling money so you might get uh, uh, I think it's $80 uh, what they call expenses and $20 per dog for something else so everyone gets something to go home with uh, but these price st uh, per structure around Victoria is the two main metropolitan tracks they race, I think the minimum prize money for first is about 6,000. Uh, so it's around about 10,000 per race. Uh, it, then that's at our two metropolitan tracks. At our country tracks, it's around about 2,000 to the winner. Um, and then we have a very low grade meetings uh, that may be $1,000 to the winner. So that's yeah. how, uh, how it works. So it, it caters for all dogs. And hopefully that's the, the idea is to keep more dogs in the system by, by catering for the, uh, the lower class dog. Yeah. And, and do all the tracks in Victoria there um, or anywhere in Australia, do they all feature eight dog races or do some prefer six dogs? Uh, eight dog racing is, is standard. Um, in saying that in the last two to three years, we have had a dog shortage on the track. And uh, there's been a number of, I think the average right now would be around about seven dogs per race. It's uh, just been a bit, uh, uh, I think you've got to go back to, right back to 2015-16 uh, when it looked like racing was going to be banned in New South Wales. Yeah. And it, 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 locked, it knocked the confidence out of the breeders. And it's taken all this time to actually get back to, um, you know, even though we've got plenty of dogs to, to getting the, the dogs at racing age um, and the the, le the amount of racing we're doing, we really, uh, we, we need a few more. Yeah. At, at what age in your training uh, experience, do they, what age do they first go to the, not the, the track, but the official track, but the, the training track? When do you start turning them, let them go around a, a bend or two? <laughs> I start at around about 12 months. Um, I may even start a little bit earlier nowadays. Uh, just and it's it's not a lot of rigor in it. Not a lot. It's just more to uh, uh, visualise and see at the track. We'll, it will often take two or three of those ten months old pups to the track when we're racing, just to let them get the feel of going with the other dogs. Let them watch the lure go around and take them home. But at around about twelve months is what people do to break the dogs in. Uh, to racing and then it they go into pre-training at around about 16 months what we call pre-training and we're not allowed to start a dog here until they're 18 months 
and that's 18 months that's the youngest they can race that's yeah. right yeah yeah that's interesting now do you feel that when you take the young ones out and let the other let them stand by the track and watch do you feel like they they learn from the Absolutely. experience there's no doubt that I, my opinion is the more handling a young dog gets uh the more experiences the ride in the car the visually hearing that or even hearing the lure or visually watching it go around it, it all makes for a, a, a dog that focused and wants to be there yeah yeah uh when you um do you have you know we have the whirly gig here in the u.s i'm sure you've seen that uh do you do you have that in australia yeah um and, and going back as i said before that 10 months period i start to use a whirly gig we call it a bull ring here and uh, I don't know why, but that's the, the difference. But uh, uh, but again, at, at about that 10 months age, we may have a, uh, a starting box there and we'll back them into that uh, into, from the front, put it down and let the whirly gig go around a couple of times. And then, and quite often I've, I'll have taken even my six months old pups out there in, a, in three or fours and let them go around. And it's, it's, it's all of this is fun, but yeah. But it's getting getting them used to it so there's no fears, there's no there's no uh, panic attacks when they do get older. Yeah, yeah. And just make a game of it. it absolutely. That's uh, it, it's there's no doubts that uh, they do remember things, puppies. And, yeah. Uh, just just a quick 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 story. Um, when I was in Abilene, we took some puppies that are. Uh, eight weeks out out of the whelping shed and put them into the yard and as we're going down there I just for fun I said to my son what if we'll put them around the whirly gig with the mum anyway they played and they pulled on it and carried on with it anyway I, I went home and six months later we were putting other dogs around that whirly gig and those puppies down the yard that hadn't seen it since started to fight because they absolutely remembered that so that that taught me something that they do remember yeah, absolutely. Now, what? Um, uh, speaking of Abilene, do you still have your farm there, or have you uh, sold it, or what's the what's the current state of operations there? No, no, we sold it a couple of oh, probably eighteen months ago. Um, we we couldn't get over there because of COVID. We we were in strict yeah. lockdown. There was no flights, um, and and as I said, it was really tough to run both both ends of it. But we enjoyed our six or seven years of doing it because, and it was really. While we had fun and it was a good good little business, um, it was more about the friends we've made over there. And and uh, as I say, we just it's a good excuse to get over there. Yeah, yeah. Do you still go over for the for the spring and fall meets? Yeah, absolutely. I I, I try not to miss them. I, I really enjoy it. And it's uh, it, it's sad that uh, less and less um, dogs are there, less and less people there. Yeah. There's more and more more and more adoption people there, which is great. But uh, but the actual the, the the dogs and the dog people it's declining. Do you come over uh, to, to to buy dogs at the auction ever, uh, or is that or is it more a just to say hello and greet everybody look, these days? Look, to be honest, um, it, buying or selling a dog is the excuse to get over there. So. Uh, the, in, in fact, I just love the people. We've we've got to know a lot of people over the years, and uh, we really enjoy that part of it. But we have we've purchased dogs. Uh, I tend to try to find uh, females that are very young to take back because we've got that six to seven months uh, lag with uh, being able to bring a dog to Australia because of the quarantine restrictions. So. Um, I try to find the, the youngest, handy, good good female that I can, that I know that I can breed on with later. Um, we, we've done very well out of that. We had uh, we bought a female called uh, You See Me Typhoon uh, off Jay Wrangle. Uh, she went home, at, she, she, we purchased her at 13 and a half months. Uh, she went back and produced a, a, a female called Fanta Bale, who won uh, 1.3 million and uh, won nine stakes races, uh, group one races, we call them. So for all the excuse of going over there, just visit friends, it, it turned out pretty well 
Um, yeah, yeah. It could control. pay off as well as the social aspect of it as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, when they come over from uh, America to Australia, what's the, what is the quarantine protocol? Do they have to be in a quarantine kennel for so much, so long? No, uh, they do, but how it works is that immediately you decide to send the dog to Australia. You've got to get the dog uh, blood tested, rabies jabbed, and uh, microchipped. At that point of time, uh, the clock starts ticking and you can't send the dog to Australia for six months. So you can race it in America. Uh, you can keep it on a farm in America or whatever you want to do. Then when, you, when it comes to Australia, then it's 10 days in quarantine uh, facility and then, then you can, you've got the dog. So that's why we tended to try buy the younger type dog because uh, it, it, it didn't really uh, affect their racing career. Yeah. Let's go back to the Australian tracks a bit and uh, talk a little bit about the kind of the infrastructure there. Uh, what on the tracks you race on, what uh, what percentage are, are sand surface and what are grass? The majority are sand um, in, in some uh, northern New South Wales and uh, Queensland areas where, you know, there's prolific growth of grass. They, they have got grass tracks. Uh, but that's getting rarer and rarer. It's uh, most of them over the years have changed over the sand. Um, our track surfaces, I would say, are quite uh, firm compared to American surfaces. I'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing either. I, I've advocated a lot we should uh, um, put the harrows through them a little bit more. But uh, uh, it's it's always interested me that that. Americans seem to get more starts out of their dogs in Australia, and uh, you've got to question why. And that's just one of the things I've noticed that uh, your tracks are, are not as um, not as firm. So I don't think you get the dra jarring up effect that we we may get. Yeah. Um, but but it, yeah, look, we've got a yeah, inside lure in Australia, um, cable lure. The the setup's a little bit different, but but it's not that different that American dogs can't adapt to Australia and vice versa. Yeah. What, uh, do you like the, the, the grass tracks or would you prefer that they were all sand? I think, uh, I think I'd prefer the sand. Uh, it, look, grass tracks are great in that they don't throw up any muck and, and the dogs probably get a cleaner run from behind. Um, but the maintenance of grass and I've seen it over years where there'd be certain turns that they just can't keep grass on it. So you've got a, a little patch of, of sand and then the rest. It, so it's a little bit uh, uh, bit dodgy that way. I, I would prefer sand where they can do it professionally and, and, and uh, have a, a proper clean surface. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, in horse racing, there's they, tend to, they seem to tend to specialise. You know, you have horses that run on grass, on turf, and then you have horses that run on dirt is that is that true with greyhounds or do you find most greyhounds doesn't make any difference uh, i don't think it makes any difference it's it in australia it would be that the, the dogs that live in the area where they've got a grass track race on it and most of the dogs don't live in those areas would never race on it so it's not as so um i i can't remember see most of the most of the grass tracks in australia are our out of country tracks yeah. so and, and I don't go there, so I cannot remember the last time I did race on a, on a grass track. <laughs> now, um, a, a question, that, a topic that I enjoy talking about in racing is um, match racing. How do you, how, do you, is there much match racing in Australia? It's starting to become a little bit more common. And uh, we, we have what they call a speed star series here and for quite good money too. And, They've, they've, I think it's really, really good. Um, I think the punters like it, and I think that uh, that so they do multiple. So they might be eight races in a row where they they're trying to uh, pick their eight winners. So they get quite a big dividend out of if they can win. So it's it's not as though it's uh, uh, just two dogs racing. It's really it might be sixteen dogs racing, but it's all match races. And but look, it's it's been very, very good. Uh, and I think down the track, uh, greyhound racing, if it's going to survive, they really need to look at innovation like that because 
match racing is a lot cleaner, a lot, le lot less injuries, injuries. And as I said, if, if, the, if the punters like it, why not do it? And that's, I would say that we should be looking really hard at that. And from a trainer's standpoint, does it make any difference to you as far as purse money or, or that sort of thing? It hasn't. If they ran it all the time, it may do. I don't know. But as they run it intermittently, like they might have every three months, we might have uh, a match race meeting. Uh, as the prize money has been very, very good for it. So, And they tell me that the, the turn, turnover or the handle on it is very, very good. And also... After the uh, what do you call it, the match race meetings, there is a spike in betting, so it must have some uh, yeah yeah some interest yeah. Well, there's kind of a you know it, it has that look of uh, it takes you back to the coursing routes when they ran in braces and and you yeah. know one dog head to head against the other. I that's why I'm a big fan of it. We don't of course have any of it here in the U.S., but um, everybody I've talked to in in Ireland and England and Australia said yeah I think that's that's a great idea. I suggested to Rob McCauley of Greyhound Racing New South Wales, why don't you have a, some match races where the best of Victoria, best Greyhound in Victoria runs against the best New South Wales Greyhound. And, you know, that gets a lot of interstate rivalry and so forth going. Would that ever work? It, it would work. It, it, and it does happen on a small scale, but I, I, I just think there should be more of it. And I, I'd go even further with technology today. Uh, and with what we call finish links, so they, they the timing mechanisms is down to one thousandth of a of a, a, of a yeah. second. We could have handicap racings over uh, over uh, um, um, match races. In other words, you could have a, a a very good dog against a not so good dog, and you could ha people could bet that they can win by five tenths of a second or or four seconds. So you could yeah. you could add that into it that. You got multiple layers of betting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be uh, that would be a lot of fun. Let's talk a little bit about your breeding practices, uh, Robbie. What do you have any kind of overriding philosophy about particular bloodlines that you try to uh, to uh, emphasize in your program? What what do you try to do overall? Obviously, we all try to breed the best of the best. But what's your yeah. what's your philosophy? Um, my philosophy first is to breed a dog that can run 500 metres or, or further. I think there's in Australia there's been too much emphasis on pure speed. So we, we've tended to find the dogs are getting shorter and shorter. Um, there's way too many uh, 400 metre races here, which uh, is purely come about because of uh, our tracks cater for 400 meter racing so all of a sudden the next stud dog might be a 400 meter dog and they then breed with females that only run 400 meters and it's uh, I, as i said i tend to try to breed my first thing is i want to be able to run 500 meters plus and it's worked very well for me because the pool of dogs over five to seven hundred meters now is less and less so if you've got if you've got a number of those dogs you you tend to uh uh you, you know, it's less competition, I guess. Yeah. Do you find that size, uh, what they what they end up weighing in, in their overall structure as adults plays into it? I, you, for example, in the Irish coursing greyhounds, you know, they run that straight for three or 400 yards and they've, they're producing huge greyhounds now over there. Is there yeah. a similar yeah. trend in Australia or do you, do you breed for a particular size? No, I don't. I, I think that, Size is not a, as important as as actual confirmation. In other words, if if their uh, if if their size is matched by their confirmation, um, it's not. If they're a small dog, as, as long as they've got leg, um, and again, it's it's our tracks aren't straights like in Ireland in coursing. And sure, we'd be struggle to beat a a massive hundred pound or ninety pound dog up up a straight, but because we run around um, little circles, um, sometimes the, the smaller female is exactly what you want. So yeah, it's it, it's a uh, yeah. It's look, I've had them all. I've had small females. I've had I won a race last night of a dog that's almost forty kilos, so he's a very big dog. So um, I never worry about that. It's more to do with their makeup and confirmation. 
Yeah. And the yeah. other thing too, I think that uh, I look very hard at not just the ability of the mother and father. I look at the temperament um, and their habits. Uh, it's just uh, we we tend over here just to look at the clock, and I don't think in America. I think they're a little bit smarter in that regard than us. Um, we look at the clock all the time and we want to go to that dog or use this female simply because of the, what they can run compared to they might be uh, they might be uh, stressy, they might be timid and we don't look at that way, way enough and that, that's what I try to look at and that's why I tend to sometimes use my own dogs simply because I know their habits yeah. and I know, their, I know that uh, um, if they throw those habits into it, you'll have a, a, quite a good greyhound. Now, are you? Do you find that you're breeding primarily to Australian bloodlines, or are you mixing in some bloodlines from other countries? Uh, I, I mix them in, and I think I really believe in an outcross. I think it's it's needed quite often. I do, uh, I honestly believe that uh, uh, American females, uh, uh, sorry, Australian dogs over American females is a really really good cross. And if we if we look at it. Some of the most successful uh, stud dogs in America have been disappointing here, and vice versa. Our some of our very good stud dogs here have been disappointing in Ireland. So that's what I'm, what I'm getting at. Is it's sometimes more about the cross rather than than uh, the actual ability of the dog. Because DJ's Octane was a sensational dog in America, but he didn't throw much out here. Head Honcho was a sensational stud dog in Australia, but he didn't throw much in in Ireland. As, as, sorry, he didn't throw much in Australia, but but he, he his sons, I should say, but in Ireland, his sons have been tremendous. So it tells me that if you look what cross works, um, you, you might be a, a generation ahead of everyone else. Yeah. Do you think that there's going to be more breeding to the American stud dogs as... Um, there's less of it here in the U.S. A lot of breeders are, you know, they have frozen semen and they say, what are we going to do with this? Uh, do you think that's going to give an incentive for Australian breeders to, to go to those American studs more frequently? I don't think so, actually. I think that um, our breeding is now, a, you, you can look into it, nearly any breed in, Amer in Australia at the moment and there's a lot of American in it now. So I think we're nearly looking to breed back to our colonial dogs uh, because the American, while the American influence has been brilliant for Australia, I think it's got the stage now you, you, uh, you nearly need to look for something else. And the other thing too is we could, we could look at, in the past at uh, um, you know, the great dogs of Derby Lane or Southland and all of a sudden, it's it's difficult to know what is a good dog and what's not if there's only a couple of tracks left. And it's yeah. I think there's going to be a little bit of a decline in the use of American dogs over over maybe not the next five years, but after that. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your interaction with um, Australian um, the Australian rehoming organisations. What uh, what relationships do you have with them? Um, unfortunately, look, I probably have, no, have got more friends in the American um, rehoming organisations that I do in Australia. But, uh, that's one thing I really think is positive in America, that they, they've got the rehoming people uh, mixing and intermingling with the, the racing people, whereas in Australia it's nowhere near as much as it should be. So you tend to find that there's... Uh, racing and anti-racing people more in Australia uh, in the rehoming area than in America. Yeah. So I think that's something we can learn from you and, and work on. Um, our rehoming, we've got a, a major centralised uh, re rehoming organisation in each state. Um, they call them Great um, Gap or Grey and Adoption Programs. And I'm not certain that's a great idea either. I think I like your system where you've got a number of chapters all around the country that uh, uh, work with the tracks and work with the trainers and, and, uh, and again, it creates that bond that, and then trust, uh, whereas in Australia, 
it's it's more a government run type uh, program there is a few uh, private ones starting to bob up which is good at uh, but our rehoming in in Australia at the moment's hit a little bit of a curveball in that uh, since COVID's finished uh, a lot of people have gone back to work a lot of people have going traveling traveling now so they don't want a dog as much as they did two years ago so we're having a, we've got a little bit of a bottleneck there at the moment and we need yeah. to sort that out yeah we've got we we have the same phenomenon we we got a spike of applications during covid when people were home more and then you know they started going back to work and then we've got the double effect of uh, the word got out that, you know, you had to wait a long time for a greyhound. Uh, and, and so that t- tended to have a downward pressure. People thought, well, I don't want to wait six months to get a, get a dog. I'll just go to the shelter or whatever. And so we're now having to educate people. Uh, we've got new sources of greyhounds. We've got Australian greyhounds coming in. We've got Irish greyhounds coming in. So get your application in and the, the queue will probably not be as long as it, as it once was. So we've had to We've had to contend with that as well. When, when you have, I think, what's your, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I just think that we, each country can learn things off each other, uh, yeah. and I do. I do think that uh, it's one thing that the uh, American system has has done really, really well for the last twenty years is adoption, and and I really, I, I come back to, um, you can go back many years ago, and we had the World Greyhound Federation. Uh, where people, countries got together and they they saw in other countries what was going was good and what's bad and you can learn from anyone. Yeah. And I think that I think that uh, we there's a real need to get that that uh, communication back together. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great idea. When you have, what's the process for you individually as a trainer? Say you've got a greyhound and he or she is, has you know um, run as many races and done as well, and they start to you know, get a little slow and they're ready to be rehomed. What's your own process? Do you, do you turn that over to the owner or do you, do they deputize you to, to do that for them? Uh, it's, it's based on the individual owner, some of them, my owners are friends and I, and obviously some of the owners haven't got the facilities. Uh, they might live uh, where a greyhound's not suitable. Uh, so I do quite a few for my owners as well. Uh, we, we actually even, uh, uh, we've got foster carers that we actually pay to take some of the dogs to, to wind them down, um, relax them and, and wait till they get into uh, to the uh, Greyhound Adoption Program. So there's, there's multiple ways, but uh, again, it's, with this bottleneck, it's, the, it's getting harder and harder because there's a number of, number of um, uh, adoption dogs taking up racing dog kennels. <laughs> which is a little bit tough. And do you use more than one organization? Uh, will, you, will you call around when you've got some dogs ready to go, some greyhounds that are, are ready for their, their post-retirement uh, 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 situations in a foster care or whatever, and then you, do you call or do you have one you always go to exclusively? Oh, basically, I go to the same one exclusively uh, all the time. But, but again, it's because they're now full and then someone else is full, um, you start to ring around and, and you find new contacts. But it's, uh, again, it, it's our little issue at the moment. I'm certain it'll, it won't take long, we'll resolve it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's we have a number of dogs uh, sitting in racing kennels. But again, uh, you know, we, we, we do it a little bit ourselves too. We'll take them into the backyard and, and uh, uh, into the house and do all that. And especially, you know, for people we know and friends and that and we, we, we sometimes I walk over four dogs when I'm trying to turn the television off or something like that. So, there's plenty of. <laughs> and what about do you place any directly yourself with people you know or that you've heard yes. that locally might want a greyhound as a pet? Yeah, I've been very lucky. Probably the last four or five in the last couple of months, I've placed. Very lucky, got a lady that works for me. She works. She does. She does a uh, greyhound walking group. And uh, she's always she's the best salesman of all time. She's she gets uh, she gets rid of quite a few for us. Yeah, no, oh, that's great. Well, I've got some. Uh, we we've been, we've started a new feature here on on uh, the podcast that we call the lightning round, 
And so uh, if you're game, I'd like to ask you a series of uh, short questions. You can give me as short or as long an answer as you as you care to, and we'll just kind of work through them. I always find this is interesting. You get a lot of good, interesting answers. So um, first one is uh, hopefully easy for you. Best Greyhound you ever trained? Probably Fanta Bale or Tornado ATs. I can't split them. Both, both dogs were, uh, you know, just they were out and out champions and, um, and, and they were different eras, so it's hard to, hard, to, uh, uh, hard to split them. I think I saw your picture on your Facebook page with one of them, and he had a, a presentation blanket on that said something like uh, richest greyhound ever or something along those lines. It had one more purse money than any greyhound to date at that time. At that time, she, she that was Fanta Bale. She'd won uh, 1.3 million, and uh, uh, since then, though, we've uh, the last three or four years, there's been a number of million dollar races in Australia. So uh, she's down the list a bit now. That uh, so people can uh, people can win that in a in a hurry if you've got the right dog now. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Worst greyhound you ever trained. You don't have to necessarily name it. You can just tell it tell us, or you can if you want to. I can't remember the name, but you always remember the ones that bark a lot, the ones that bite your wire, and the ones that <laughs> that piddle. They're, they're, they're the worst greyhounds I train. <laughs> Just trouble in the kennel kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You always remember them. You only, you only ever remember the best and the worst. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, most memorable greyhound character that came through your kennel, something about the dog whether it was a great racer or an average racer, that, that was a real character that really made you laugh every day or, or you know, it was just memorable. I, I trained a dog uh, called Borna Hula Hero. The dog won his first race in Ireland at 17 months and one of my owners bought him the next day. He was an Irishman. He came to Australia. We won a number of races in Australia. We took him to... Uh, America for the million dollar race at Derby Lane. He didn't win or qualify, but we got there and then we went down, he went down to Palm Beach for the world's, whatever it was down there, something. And then um, we brought him back to Australia and he won in almost every state in Australia. I don't think there's been a dog in the world do that. Now, he wasn't the best dog ever, but I think we had the most fun with that dog I've ever yeah, had. Yeah, he could, he could win anywhere, in other words. You get off a plane and just go, yeah. He and and he loved it. He just loved it. So what did he go uh, on to do? Did he did he do stud service or would, did he become a pet or what was his? Where did he go? I, I believe I believe he sold a couple of litters, but he did end up uh, as a pet. And the uh, the owner was a uh, uh, a children's story journalist, and he actually ended up getting a a book written about him. And uh, so, but as far as I know, he's still on the couch, but he's, uh, he's got a number of books, uh, children's books. <laughs> That's great. Now, uh, your highest moment in Greyhound racing thus far, knowing that you're not near finished yet, but so far, what's been your highest moment in Greyhound racing? Oh, uh, it's, that's a tough one, uh, John. It's a, it, to me, you live in the moment and you move on. You know, we've we've won a number of great races and it's been, you know, they're all great. But I don't keep any trophies. I don't hardly keep a. Uh, I just think, enjoy the moment and move on. And that's uh, we basically do. But look, we've won a number of Australian Cups and uh, Sandown Cups and Raceland, and they're great at the time. But uh, then you always look to what's next. That's, yeah. That yeah. My, my greatest moment's the next one. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's a good. That's a good way to look at it. Greyhound owner you've enjoyed working with the most. We've had a lot of great owners, but again, it comes back to my love of uh, uh, overseas associations, and uh, I've I've trained dogs for people like Pat Dalton in in Ireland, um, Don, uh, Don Ryan in um, in Abilene. He's passed away now. Uh, things like that. Um, it's it's a lot of fun, and uh, yeah. it, and it's not about the business side of it, and that's what it's about. It's about people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Greyhound, you had the hardest time saying goodbye to when retirement time time came. Um, yeah, it's probably a dog called Symmetry. Um, Symmetry, he was just 
just a pet. You know, he's just he was a race dog all the way through. He probably raced till he's nearly six, and uh, and he was basically he, he nearly had free range. He'd, he'd walk in my office and everything. But and uh, but but it came a time we had to get rid of him, and uh, that was tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those moments will bring a tear to a glass eye, won't they? They do, and uh, I'm one of the weakest. <laughs> <laughs> So you've been known to have to have the hanky out uh, from time to time. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, most memorable race you ever watched in person? I think uh, we had a lot of fun when we came over, and I think it was 2004 for the uh, the Derby Lane Million. Um, a lot of friends from all around the world there. And it was great. Grays Calibre won the race, and just wonderful atmosphere. It was a full stadium at Derby Lane, and... I, I thought it was uh, head and shoulders above anything I'd seen around the world, even you know, even the Irish Derby or the Melbourne Cup or the Australian Cup. I thought that was the, the pinnacle. Yeah, yeah, full house that night at the track. Yeah, yeah, full full house. It was just, and, and as I said, there was uh, people from all around the world, so it was just a, a wonderful night. Yeah. Best greyhound you didn't breed or train but wish you had? Oh, probably Australian wise would be Brett Lee or Fernando Bale. They, I couldn't pick them. They they just they were just out and out standout champions. And both of them not only uh, were freaks on the racetrack, they went on to be um, the, the best size of their time and, yeah. and have left a massive legacy. So yeah, it's a, they, they're, they're wonderful greyhounds. And uh, yeah, I would have I would have found a kennel for both of them. <laughs> Did you were you able to? Watch them both race uh, in in real time and put your hands on them, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Raced against them many times and um, usually watched them from behind because they they were, they were <laughs> in front of us. Yeah, yeah. They, well, I've got some Brett Lee progeny in in my kennel, so I I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Brett Lee and Trent Lee for sure. So, any plans to retire? No, I don't think greyhound people do retire, John. I think you just you know, you keep, you may fade away, but you just keep going. You know. <laughs> but, uh, what's uh, What's next for Britain Racing? Well, probably just scale down. I, I've said this for years, but you, whether you do it or don't, my my son Tim is doing a lot of the work now, and I would like to, as I said, just do a little bit more breeding, um, and maybe reduce the numbers of other people's outside dogs. And have it to a situation where, if you said, because they're our own dogs, and if we said, okay, yeah, uh, we have an easy month this month, we won't race as much. We can do that. With with owners, you can't do that. You you're committed to them. So, just to slow down a bit. But I, I've I don't know how many years I've been saying that, and you never do it. So, <laughs> it's, that's the way it is. Yeah, yeah, it gets in your blood, and you just can't stop. Yeah, ex- absolutely, and. And, uh, and they just keep coming. There seems to be another greyhound somewhere. It always is. Yeah. Now, uh, a final question. What What do you see as the future for Australian greyhound racing? It's probably not a good story, John. Uh, uh, we're booming at the moment. We're going, our, um, our turnover or handle is going through the roof. Um, I think through COVID, we've gone from uh, nationally $5 billion dollars handle to ten billion dollars um, this year but so financially the, the, the industry is in great shape over here but we're seeing the same issues that happen with the, the anti noise is getting louder and louder um, more and more uh, tracks or uh, uh, countries are under you know under review where they should be still going. New Zealand's in a bit of trouble at the moment. Uh, Wales is in trouble. Now, all this plays... In, in the day of days of internet, um, borders won't save you. In other words, what I've seen in America over the last 20 years, some, it tends to start to happen in Australia five to 10 years down the track. And I, I'm not worried about the, the financial side of it. I'm more worried about the public opinion side of it. Whereas... Once upon a time, I could never understand what people, when I'd go to America, why they would start talking about aunties and and uh, 
the image of greyhound racing well that's that's here now so you know we, we we we've got to lift our game my opinion is greyhound racing you mentioned before about match racing my opinion greyhound racing has to not only look different into the future it has to be different and you know we've we've had the same product now for you know 70 to 100 years and uh, i think it all racing i'm not just talking uh, greyhound racing it needs to look different and be different to to survive into into decades rather than years yeah yeah i i you know the the, the new term is the social license and um, yeah. uh, I, I, I will say from the American perspective, at least from this American's perspective, I think uh, from the Australian folks I've talked to, I think, I think you folks get it. And I think that, uh, I think if Australia, if Greyhound racing is gonna survive, uh, Australia is gonna play a big role in that. At, at the moment, it's, it, as I said, it's great. Um, I'm, if I'm critical of anything, it's the fact we don't, we don't um, defend ourselves well enough. And I think we saw that in America with Florida where, you know, I saw a report said that the, the, uh, the opposition started 16 years before us in, uh, in uh, swaying public opinion. Now, we still don't get it in that space. We, uh, uh, there's a lot of bad news stories get out there in the media on a regular basis. And, and we, we as an industry haven't focused on uh, the defence or actually uh, putting the facts out there and I think that's one big thing we, if we're going to survive into the future we need to um, at least balance the argument and that's that's got to be the you know into the future I'd say that's the thing balance the argument yeah yeah well I hope you keep up the good work I think that uh, there's a lot of good things going on in Australia I think the Australian program of bringing greyhounds here for rehoming is a, is a component of that, and um, I wish you all the all the luck and the best. And I thank you for for spending some time with us. You're pretty busy setting up a new kettle there in Brisbane, so um, we we certainly appreciate your your time and and hearing about your experiences. Yeah, anytime, John. Thanks for that. It's uh, good. To, anytime we talk about greyhound racing, it's it's fun. That's it. That's it. Thanks again, Robbie, and thanks for joining us on the Greyhound Nation. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you're not a regular listener, be sure to follow Greyhound Nation wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Grey Nation Show, follow us, and you'll get notifications every time we release a new episode. You can also get new show notifications when you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you like the episode, leave us a review on our Facebook page or your favorite podcast app. You can also send us feedback or questions via the contact form on our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. This episode was produced in collaboration with host John Parker. Our theme music was composed and performed by Dimitri Taurus. We enjoyed having Robbie Britton as our guest this episode. If you'd like to learn more about the Britton family's training activities, visit their Facebook page. Just search for Britain Greyhounds. That's B-R-I-T-T-O-N. I'm Michael Burns, and you've been listening to Greyhound Nation.